Welcome to Access Europe for April. It's meant to be spring, but it's still raining incessantly here in the UK. This month, we have all the way from the eastern side of America, former MVP Dale Fye, who used to run the Eastern Time chapter of Access User Groups and decided to take retirement from that. I can't blame him. And he's going to be talking about command bars and also his Access Shortcut tool, which makes life a lot easier these days to work with command bars. Finally, he's going to be talking about a simple audit tool that he's got as well. The website for Dale, and you'll get a download for the, uh, the Access Shortcut tool from there, is httpdevsolution.com. Are you ready, Dale? I am. Over to you. Hi, I'm Dale Fai. I'm the owner of Developing Solutions LLC, um, and my website is listed there. I'm a, I'm a retired Army officer. I've been developing in Microsoft Access since '94 when I was on active duty as an Army officer. I've been an MVP. I was an MVP from 2013 through 2016. And I generally contribute mostly uh, most of my stuff on uh, experts exchange, and I'll, I'll give some provide some links to some articles I've written there with regard to shortcut tool and my uh, simple audit log. So, what is a shortcut menu? I mean, we all deal with them every day. Technically, it's part of a collection of the command bars collection, um, and I've just thrown a couple of images up there to you know let you remind you of what a shortcut looks like. So, command bar history back in the day. Prior to 2007, Access had a built-in tool for creating menu bars. It was part of what is now the Quick Access of uh, the QAT wizard. But in 2007, they deprecated that tool, took it, removed it from Access, and made it much more difficult to create shortcut menus. I was using shortcut menus a lot at the time, and I decided that I needed to that I didn't like writing the code necessary to create shortcut menus. So I decided I wanted to create my own tool to do it um, and make the process easier. In 2010, we they did access did away with the menu uh, command bars. The stuff that shows up in the top in on the top row of, of your access window, those used to be a, a menu bar as opposed to a, a ribbon bar. And you could actually position that menu either on the top or the left or the bottom of your application if you wanted to. But those were command bar menus. And when you clicked on one of those, it would show the pop-up options that were available for that, or the other options that were available for those menus. And many of those were set with, with multiple levels of drill down capability. Starting in 2010, when they replaced the command bar menus with the ribbon, you were still able to create shortcut menus but you could not create a, I should say a pop-up shortcut menu, but you were not able to create the, the command bar menus themselves. And you can still build shortcut menus using code if you choose to do that. Uh, and I think probably many of you do. You can still import your shortcut menus from previous versions. So if you still have 2003 sitting around somewhere and you wanted to build your shortcut menus in that pre-built tool, you could do that and then you could do an import from that particular access application into current versions of access. Although you would probably have to do it in stages because I don't think I don't think I can import from 2003 files into 365, but I haven't tried that yet. Another interesting thing issue about command bars is that they uh, runtime applications cannot use the default shortcut menus, but you can use your own. So how many how many command bars are there? Well, it, Access itself has over 200. You can you can determine how many are in your particular version just by using the immediate window and typing application.commandbars.count. If you want to know the names of all of the command bars, you can just use code similar to what I have here in the middle of the screen. If you wanted to know the names and properties of the various controls that are in, exist in a command bar, you could use this set of code at the bottom and possibly extend that a little bit to include things like the enabled property and the visible property, and maybe even the on action property, all of which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Shortcut menus are context sensitive. So depending on what you're doing in Access, certain elements of the set of controls in that shortcut menu 
may be visible, they may be hidden, or they may be disabled, uh, as you can see in this top in this top version. You can see most of the controls that are visible using that show pop-up method of the command bars collection. But that will not necessarily display all of the options if some of them are not visible by default. So that's just one way to do it. We'll talk a little bit more about other ways here shortly. Uh, Built-in menus. In the version of Access that I'm running, uh, I'm using 365 32-bit version at the moment, there are 204 built-in menus in the command bars collection. The Problem is that there's no easy way to determine which menu you're seeing when you do a draw a right click and a menu pops up. That's one of the advantages of the shortcut tool is it itemizes all of the shortcut menus and then highlights the or displays all of the, the controls that are part of that menu. You can very easily determine specific properties of the command bar and its controls using the immediate window. But one of the things that I caution you on is that command bars have a name property, but controls uh, for some reason don't. They have a caption property instead of a name property. So if you're trying to enumerate or list the properties of a caption, you need to know that yeah, of a control, you need to know the caption that's displayed on the control. Another interesting piece of information is that the command bar has an index property, but that property isn't consistent. You can open a an access database today and display the list of command bars and then open it again tomorrow and the list of command bars will be the same, but the index property that's associated with each of those some of them will change. And the other interesting thing is if you add or delete a command bar. So, so if you have one of your custom menus built, if you add or delete one, it will change all those number, those indexes again. Uh, sometimes it'll, it'll insert if you're adding a command bar, sometimes it'll insert the command bar in the middle of a sequence where there's a, a gap in numbers. And when you delete them, sometimes it will, sometimes it will compress the, the list, sometimes it won't. No consistency there. Controls, I'm making the statement here that controls also have an index property, which is consistent. Now, when I was talking to, Ian, uh, to uh, Colin yesterday, he indicates that in that at least one instance in, that he's played with, the controls index property is, is not consistent and it changes. So that, that's something that might be interesting as well. I need to do some digging in that area to find out about that. And there's even a one of the properties that, that I rarely use, but which is available is there is a face ID property for command bar controls that allows you to um, assign a icon like image to that control so that you'll see an icon instead of just a standard button that you would see in a control. So I'll just pause right here real quick, Colin. Does anybody have any questions so far? There's been no questions so far. There was a comment from Adrian, though, about why the controls have a caption property rather than a name property. Do you want to expand uh, on that, Adrian? Just, and, and Colin's clarified as well. Um, the reason is that if it were name, it would have to be unique across the full set. Whereas command uh, the control, there is a requirement for it to be unique within a command bar. If you add them, obviously you can add these controls to more than one command bar if you want to. But within a command bar, the caption has to be unique. But within all of the, the controls that you can add in there, the name, the, the caption doesn't need to be unique, isn't unique. Sorry. I, I was not aware of that. So using built-in command bars uh, in your applications, I frequently disable the built-in command bars, especially on forms and reports. Um, I don't like the user being able to right-click on a, anywhere in a form and have a big long list of items come up, one of which is generally design view. So I, I generally disable my command bars on forms and reports. Reports. And specifically on reports, I like to build my own because I want a much more restrictive set of options for my for the users in, in most of my applications. As I mentioned before, built the built-in command bars are disabled in runtime applications, but you can create your own command bars and use them throughout. So you might have a command bar that's just a form copy paste command bar where all you have listed in the, is the shortcut it either cut copy and paste those kinds of options that way you can right click on a text or, or a, a control you know select cut or copy and then paste it someplace else like i said before it's difficult to determine which command bar you're seeing when you right click data sheets for example have 21 different command bars that are available now. some of those are available in design view some of those are available when the data sheet is viewed as a form in and of itself and some of those are available when 
when the data sheet is viewed as a subform. So figuring out what shortcut menu you're seeing can be complicated. You can manipulate the built-in command bars in your applications. You can disable them, you know, set the enabled property to no, in which case when you right click in a control where you think you should see something, you'll either not get any response or you'll see just a, a little grayed out box. And I'll try to show this to you when we get to the, the access application. What I would warn you is you must be very careful when you, if you try to manipulate built-in command bars. If you're adding options, if you're adding controls to a command bar, that's fine, and, but I would only do so by making them temporary add-ons. So basically every time you run the application, you would add the command bar, and every time the application closes, you would remove those items from the, the command bar. Otherwise, when you get to a different application and perform that same right-click operation, you'll see that option that you created in another app, and it may or may not have the associated functionality built into the, the new app. Playing with the built-in command bars can be troublesome. For example, yesterday I found that I had a data sheet row command bar that was disabled. I don't know why. I'm sure it happened in one of my other applications. And when I built this new application, it just started, it came up as disabled. So after I re-enabled it, I performed that same right-click operation. And although it was there, there was still nothing displayed. So I went back in and looked and all of the controls had their visible property set to false. So that, so I went through and had to update that visible property to true, and then everything seemed to work fine after that. Okay, so creating your shortcut menu. If you're gonna do this, the easiest way to start out with is set a reference to the Microsoft Office object library. That way you'll get, you'll get IntelliSense as you type and, and work. There are a number of variables that you will need to create as you go. I generally just use the, the command bar and the command bar control variables. I rarely refer to a control specifically by its type, the command bar button or combo box. But if you do that, you'll have obviously have the additional IntelliSense that would go with a button or, or a combo box. So that advantages there. When you define a command bar, you have to provide it a name and then you can, can optionally provide a position, a menu bar, and a, temp and a temporary. Basically, you're never going to use menu far uh, now that we're now that menus are bars are not available. You're going to have to provide it a name. Obviously, it must be the command bar name must be unique, so you can't duplicate an existing command bar name. The position is basically a, just a description of the type of menu bar it is, and it's for pop-up menus for shortcut menus. It's got to be a five, has to be a five. Uh, and then there's a temporary property which determines whether or not that command bar will remain in the application when you close the application. So for example, if you want to create a command bar once and keep it in the application, you would say temporary equals false. And then you would never need to rerun that code that builds that command bar because that command bar would be would exist within that access database and would be able you would be able to use it again in the future without rebuilding it. When I first started doing command bars, for some reason the code that I used said temporary is equal to true. So I had to call the code every time I ran the application. It wasn't until I started really digging into the guts of the command bars that I finally realized that I only really needed to run that code once as if I set the temporary property default. I've seen a couple of comments flash up on my screen. Were any of those questions or comment, specific comments that somebody wanted to make? There was a question from Ant. There's been quite a lot of discussion since. He wanted to check whether command bars are application specific. In other words, if you activate a command bar, and leave it activated, will that still be available in another application, another access application? User-defined command bars are specific to the ACC DB they're built in. So if, if I create a command bar in one application, and then I close that application and, and open another application, that command bar will not be visible to me at that point. Although you can use the, the external data wizard and there's an option down there that says, there's a button that says options or something or other. And one of the options has a checkbox that says menu bars or something like that. So you can import that command bar from a different uh, application, but it does not automatically stay with access. Can I just qualify it? I'm not sure. sure if you said this. If you modify a built-in command bar by disabling or hiding any of the menu items and you forget to undo those changes before you close your app, then each of the apps will then continue to have the modified built-in command bar 
and I had experienced that to my as a problem when I ended up with a dotted square uh, instead of a context menu. Nothing at all was visible when I clicked on form controls. Anyway. Yeah, the, the built-in command bars are, in fact, part of the access EXE object, as it were. So any changes that are made, and that's why I highlighted in red, working with the built-in ones uh, is, pro is problematic. Yeah, there are lots of opportunities to screw that up. And, you know, the best, if you're going to work with the built-in ones, if you're going to add controls to them, which is fine, I would make those temporary and I would add them every time you run the application, each application you're using. If you're doing something like, I don't know, some of you may have seen Colin's recent uh, article on locking down uh, access. And basically what he does is he, he makes most of the controls on a bunch of the command bars, he disables them. I'm sure somewhere in that code, and I haven't had a chance to look at it yet, but somewhere in his code, he re-enables those when he closes when he closes the application definitely yeah have to because because otherwise they'll, one of the places where he does that there's three or four different menus that are associated with the navigation pane and he basically disables all of the controls in each of those man bars so that if if you then go to another application all of those controls are still going to be disabled unless you go back and and, and re-enable them somewhere so uh, you got to be careful with that Okay, we've got a couple of other people. Adrian, do you want to go first? Oh, sure, why not? As far as the command bars being application relevant, you talked earlier, Dale, about the command, the application .command bars, command bars collection. And if I, I struggle to understand how a command bar is added to that collection that it is not in the app, it is not in within access the application. It may not be visible because the context might not be right. My understanding is that the command bars, any that you add, are nevertheless added to the to access rather than simply to your application, even though you can choose in your application when and how to show those. Does that does that make sense or am I completely? Well, it, it does make sense. If I move from one application to another and run my shortcut tool, you know, I iterate through the elements of the command bars collection to build a couple of tables, one that has the command bar names and properties, and then another one that has all of the controls and, it, and their properties that are associated with the bar. Mm -hmm. When I do that, I do not see any of those command bars that were built in other applications. So my That's my assumption bit. my assumption is that Access is building those into a a separate collection that exists as part of the particular ACCDB file that only applies to user defined command bars. I don't know that for for in, for certain. Uh, I just know that I can't see those. If I move from one application sure. to another and run the command bar tool again, the collection, the command bars collection does not display those other command bars that I've built. But you can confirm that the com the collection that you refer to is the application dot command bars collection. Yes. In both cases. Well, yes. I see that I see that as a conundrum. I hear everything you say. It makes good sense. It looks like you've you've looked into this quite carefully. But there's still things which make it look anomalous, as in it almost it's like contradictory. So the problem is there's so there is so little documentation on command bars. Oh yeah, I'll bet. Um, <laughs> you know, you know, I did a lot of testing and and digging oh. and uh, internet searches, but there is so little actual documentation on command bars. The the four articles that I wrote were far more information than I was able to glean from any one site sure. prior to my starting this project. Am I convinced that I know everything there is to know about command bars? Absolutely not. I don't want to take you off topic for too long. I know Zevi's got a, a question for you. I just want to bring to your attention um, that Crystal has mentioned that MSYS tables, um, there might be some command bars information stored there, but I won't, I, I'm going to go off. You've answered my question as well. As well as anyone can so i'm i'm happy with that right there is a question from chris i'm fairly certain there is no command bar information in any of the system tables uh somebody may prove me wrong but i'm almost certain that's the case chris you have yeah a uh, question. i i had uh, did some exercises on this uh, years ago with uh using uh, shortcut menus to manage sorting and filtering of ADO record sets, which the standard access forms won't won't handle. And those I had to create in every single application I had. And I think it's stored 
as a property of the database, property of the front end. That's quite possible. I have not dug deep enough to determine where that information is actually stored regarding each application, but I know it is. Would you like to carry on then, uh, Dale? Yeah, um, so uh, control properties. The, obviously, the, the first property associated with each control is its caption, but it's what you see when when you do the right-click menu on the screen. The on action property defines what action will be performed when you run it, the app, when you click on that option. If you're using, I mean, you can build you can build your own shortcut menus using built-in access shortcut control. And we'll get to that here shortly. Um, in which case you won't have an on, if you do that, you're not gonna have an on action property. On action is, that's the, that's basically for you to build your own code as to what you want to happen when somebody clicks on that button or enters data in a text box or whichever. Face ID, like I said before, you can add a, an image, a, a, an icon type image to your shortcut menus. I don't generally do it, probably just because I don't have a really good icon editor and I'm not a really good graphic person. So, so uh, even if I did, I'm not sure I would be able to, to create icons that I would like for use. Obviously, there's a, a visible property and enabled property. There's a begin group property. Right click on a menu and there's a, a line that goes across between as a separator. That's what the ben begin group property is. It's a yeah, it's a true false value. You can provide tool tips and uh, there is a state property to indicate whether or not the, the control is checked or not. Uh, we talked about these already. Runtime shortcut menus are disabled. You can copy built-in ones. And my my access shortcut tool does that really easily. And one of the four articles I've got out on uh, Experts Exchange talks about using command bars in a runtime environment. For example, if you're looking at a data sheet, there's a row command bar, there's a column command bar, or there's a cell command bar. And you can use the context of the data sheet by either counting the number of rows that are selected or counting the number of columns that are selected to determine, or both, to determine whether you've actually selected a column, a row, or a cell, or multiples of those. A good article out there that talks about how to do that if you want to, if you want to be able to use command bars in a runtime environment, especially with like a data sheet. Using it, using it with a, a regular form or a report, you just create your command bar and modify the command bar menu property of your of your form or report or control and it, it, will, it will use your user defined command bar just like it would the built-in command bar okay so the access shortcut tool obviously i built it to make it easy to work my way through the command bars and figure out what they were and what they were doing but also to create my own command bars one of the comments i've made multiple times during the discussion is that the it's difficult to identify what command bar is displayed when you do a right click. One of the options I use in my shortcut tool is, is I have a checkbox in the options menu that says display a what's this I what's this menu. So, so it adds that control at the bottom of every menu of command bar menu so that when you right click, all you gotta do is go down to the bottom one and click on that item and it will tell you which command bar you're using, which makes it easy for you to refer to that command bar with the, the name properly. So you can in, with the shortcut tool, you can add new command bars. You can copy an existing command bar. You can even import command bars from other uh, other access databases. And then once you select a command bar, you can see all the controls and all the properties associated with each of those command bars. This is what the shortcut tool looks like when it's displayed. And at this point, I think I'm going. And, and there, here's some articles that that go along with the command bars that are out there on Experts Exchange. These are all in the file that Colin has uploaded. So in the meantime, what I'm gonna do is jump over to my shortcut demo. Okay, so what I've done here is I've created just a couple of forms to show you some of uh, forms and reports to show you what you can do with the command bar. So in this form, the first name field is a, it has command bar, shortcut menu bar is blank. It says shortcut, it's blank, so it, that means it's automatically going to use the the default. In this unbound in this unbound control, it's set to form controls. And actually, that's what I wanted to do here as well. So now, if I go here, the form view. If I if I right click on on my last name, this this is the the form 
for, I think it's form view control menu. Actually, let's do that real quick. Let's go back up here and do add-ins access shortcut tool. As I mentioned before, when you run the shortcut tool, you basically have to iterate through the command bar collection, and that's what this is doing. I've found that a couple of people, I don't know, was it you, Colin, that this just takes forever to run? It takes quite a while. It'd be quite nice to make it optional, but I know why you can't. Yeah, so at any rate, so here's that. If I go to the options now, and I set add, uh, check the add what's this menu and hit save, then I can minimize this control. Now, if I come in here and right click, I've got the what's this menu here at the bottom, and you'll see that the 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 built-in menu that's associated with controls is named Form View Control. Um, so if I go up here to Dale, what you'll see is I've got a, a slightly different one that I built myself. This is my my form controls, and it, all it's got is copy and paste. And again, you'll see that that's these are the built these are built-in access controls, so they are case sensitive by default. Uh, so in this case, I can't paste in here because I don't have anything in my in my uh, clipboard. But if I copy that and I go over here, now I've now I can paste. So you'll see that those two menus that show up in here are, are vastly different. In many cases, you might want to leave the things like equals, does not equal, contains, does not contain, those kinds of filters. You may even want to leave the text filters. But for the most part, I don't care to do that with most of my application. I, I also mentioned that, as you recall, well, let's, let's go to the data sheet view. So here's the here's the, the form with that same, basically that same form as a data sheet. And if, if you see right here, now I'm having problems with this, that right click, I should be able to right click on that on that control, but I can't for some reason. When I right click on the header, it gives me the standard form data sheet sub column menu. If I click on a particular cell, it gives me the form data sheet cell menu. So you can see all of those, but let's go back over to here. Dale, before you move yes. on, while, yes. you're, while you're on there, can you just right click on the title bar of that form and see what it comes up with? with the What's this menu? Because that's one of the nameless ones. This is one. This is one of the nameless ones. You're right that we talked about before. Yeah. Okay. I just wondered if it would yep. somehow magically find a name there. Okay. So what I wanted to do here was look at um, some of the data sheets. So I've got a I've got a filter built in where I can I can basically filter the command bars based on either the name of the command bar or the name of a control that's in the command bar. In this case, I want to. I want to look for data sheet, data sheet ones. And you'll see, like I said before, there's there's 21 of them. Form, but what I'm looking for is form data sheet row. That's what I'm looking for right here. What I'm going to do is check to see whether that minimize this. I'm going to go here over here and see if I can determine whether that command bar is enabled or not. It's not. So if I enable that, now when I right click on, on there, I should see all of the controls that are associated with that. And like I said, this is one of those that I had inadvertently turned off at some point and uh, it didn't get turned back on. So now that that's now that's working properly. When I work with reports, I do the same thing. I, I dislike seeing the design view and the layout view and uh, all the various other options that are available on a report. So generally what I do is I create my own reports menu, which is limited. It's, it lets them print it. It lets you save it as a P, basically as a PDF. It lets you send it as an attachment and it lets you close it. Generally my standard report menu, uh, occasionally I'll have other, I'll make other modifications to it. Some example code for uh, the command bars you can do. I've got this command bar list, which basically calls a, another subroutine. In this case, I've already got it set to just display the data sheet ones. And you'll, and you'll see the, the list and their associated uh, ID value with them. If I change that and do this, 
you can see that there's notice notice those numbers go all the go, go all the way up to 263 but the number of command bars that are available is i think only 204 oh no it's okay in, in this in so in office 365 apparently the number is 263 when i was working on this the other day i was in, working in 2007 and it was 204 so uh, and you'll see also you'll see that these this includes some of the command bars that I built in my shortcut tool. These are my those are ones that were built in my shortcut tool. And then there's the command bars I'm going to show for the form data sheet column. I'm going to show the controls that exist in that. Okay, so there's there you can see that there's a bunch of different forms in here. I didn't display the control type here. What you'll see is this this, this Hangul Hanja conversion. This is a pop up. That's a pop up menu that's got a, a whole bunch of options underneath of it. I'm not sure I've ever seen it visible. Actual tool itself is pretty simple to use. Like I said, you can copy a control. So if I wanted to copy the data sheet row control, I would just click on copy and I would do. And I want to make this temporary because I don't want it to repeat in this application when I close it. Um, like I said before, it will insert that command bar somewhere in the collection. And you never know quite where it is. So you have to go back and, and reiterate through the command bar collection to get that sequence. And once this refreshes, it should show up here as a not as a built in, but it didn't. So let's query it again filters so let's try look at my shortcut so this is this is, oh i did i misspelled data sheet that's why it didn't show up when i queried on data sheet um so you'll you'll see that that here here's the one that i built from controls um the i mentioned earlier this is a new version 0.13 and I've, I've recently added this delete checkbox so that theoretically you could go in here and on, on those command bars that have got lots of controls, and, but you really only want to limit it to maybe a dozen of the ones that are available. My goal is to get this set up so that once that you click on the delete buttons and then click, it goes, will iterate through the, the controls that are part of this command bar and delete the ones that are checked and then rebuild this screen for you. Uh, like I said, you can import from another application. You can delete a command bar if you want from here. Uh, although it won't won't allow you to, to delete built-in ones, you can rename it or you can preview it. And preview shows all, all the different options that are available in there. If you wanted to add another one, if I wanted to edit this, I can go out here and you'll see that this is a an, an office control. It's, not, it's a built-in office control, so I really don't have much in the way of editing capability for that control. Uh, although I can do a preview and see what it looks like there. If I want to create a new one, you just click on the add control bar, uh, give it a new name, and I can put an ampersand in front of it. So it's got a hot key. You want to make I want to make this a button, but you can make it you can make it a pop-up menu so that you can drill down. In this case, I'm just going to make it a button. It'll ask me where I want to put it. In this case, I, I want to put it, put it right before row height. I'm going to begin a new group there. And then if you want a face ID for it, you can click on access and pick various options. You know, I'm going to, I'm just going to randomly pick active to X controls and see what that looks like. Okay. And then hit next. And then on action, you would enter in the name of the function preceded by an equal sign, just like you would in a control source of a control on a form. So it'd just be equals and then hello world. And then when I click on finish, it's going to tell me that Hello World doesn't exist in the current app. It will automatically do that. One of the options that's available over here in the options menu is that you can catalog the forms, reports, and, and module names. You can tell it to do it when the application starts. You can tell it when you first use it, or you can have it do it right now. In this case, I just leave it off. It takes a while to iterate through all of the quote documents that are in the database. Cancel. So now what I want to do is go back over here to my application and do mod insert mod.
All right, save that. What was that? Okay, and this is in Dale's Dale form data sheet res. Let me copy this. Okay, Dale, so now if I go you you named it differently. In the command bar editor, you she called it hello world in your function, you called it FN hello world. Let's take a look at that. Ah, yes, you're absolutely right. So I can go back in here, edit control, next, go to function. Okay, so if we come back over here to names, view, and now I'm just going to I'm just going to change this one down here briefly. Shortcut menu bar. You'll see the the one I just added. Now if I come if I right click in here, oops, I need to make sure I get that right. Yeah. Okay, that should be correct. There we go. There's the there's my print button with the hello world on it. So that's how easy it is to create shortcut menus and controls to go in your shortcut uh, using the shortcut tool. Okay, so next thing I wanted to talk about really quickly, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Uh, I, I, have an, I have an article out on Experts Exchange on audit logs. When do you use audit logs? Common uses are financial systems where you need to be able to track any changes to data that people make, public records, and sometimes personal records. I've got a new client that I just did some work for, a police department that has a new process that they're implementing. They're getting hundreds of records from their court system every week that identify people whose records should not be released to other people. And they really wanted an audit log to, so they could track any changes in their database. So I basically took, pulled up this old audit log application that I wrote and uh, implemented it with their database. And they're, they seem to be very pleased with it. So the the general technique for doing aud for auditing tables is that when a record is changed, the general technique is that you have a separate audit table for every table you need to track in your application. Um, so you, so if you have a table persons or people, uh, you might have a table people audit that would have every field from the basic table. And then it would probably also have fields for, for audited by, audited daytime, maybe other fields associated with that as well. But generally that doesn't work within access databases if people make changes directly in tables. I don't remember what version, whether it was 10 or 13 where they implemented data macros, but apparently, I mean, you have the ability to create data macros that will do some of that functionality for you when you make changes directly in tables. But for the most part it's done in the forms and it's done in the via the before and after update events of the form and or the delete and the after delete confirm events the problem is that if you've got large tables as in wide tables with lots of fields then every field is going to get copied over into this a new record in that table when you do this so you will rapidly bloat your database when you make changes that way and then the other thing that I found when I looked at some of the tables that I implemented this to begin with was that if you've got a wide table, uh, lots of fields, it's hard to tell what field changed from one iteration to the next because you have to look at both records together and scroll right until you find one or more fields that change. I wanted something that was a little bit more specific and not quite as bulky. What I designed was an audit log that contains just a single table called audit log. And in that, it has a field name for the, the name of the table that's being edited. It has a field for action, which is either insert, edit, or delete. It has a field for action, who did it, when they did it, the primary key of the table that was being edited, that was being worked on and then the name of the field that changed and the field and the value of that field. I use this module called audit log that contains a bunch of different code. I have one line of code that gets fired from each of these four events that calls code in that audit log module that either writes data to a temp table 
or writes it to the actual audit log table. And the reason you need to do, reason I found that I needed to write data to a temp table first in the form before update event, I iterate through every control on the form to determine whether that control value has changed or not. And if so, I write a record to the uh, audit log temp table. But because you can cancel a before update event, I don't write that table into the the actual audit log table uh, until the after update event. And so I run the after update event and it writes that record. Similarly with the delete event, I do the same thing. One line of code in each of these events on your form, and then it calls the uh, code in my audit log module that actually pushes the data to and from the database. Now let me go out here real quick. So here's my audit log table, and you'll see that it's got the table name, it's got an action, it's got when the action was performed, who performed it, what the names were. I've got a form down here, audit test, and we'll skip President Trump, and we'll go back here to me, and we'll just change this, and we'll change this to my wife's name. Um, and we'll leave the date of birth the way it is for right now and we'll save it. And then if we go to the, you'll see the ID value I'm looking at is number six. The list of current values for that record shows date of birth of 1960, my wife's name and that. And if I wanna do a more extensive drill down, I can drill down on number six here. And I can see when the record was created. I can see the first change that was made. I can see the second change. I think I misspelled Earnhardt for Dale Earnhardt. But then I changed it back to my last name. And now I changed my, my wife's name. So I can very easily identify what was changed during each iteration of changes that were made. And it's all in one table. So you can, you know, you can set up a form. If you wanted to be able to track your audit log, you could set up a form that lists the table name in a dropdown, the record ID in a dropdown, or maybe you pick the action by. And then you would then display this, the results of that query like this. So we can track the changes made to a specific record over time. Does anybody have any questions? Hasn't been any questions, just a clarification from Tim. We still don't know exactly where command bar data is actually stored. I tried to look it up, but I didn't get a definitive answer either. But there hasn't been any other questions that okay. I've seen. Does anyone have a question before we come to the end of this section? No, no questions on your audit tool. Ben Satcherich? Yeah. Yes. Do you oh, have quick. to create an audit table for every table you're going to audit? No, that's why I, the table name is listed here in the, the audit log. When you run the form, I mean, when you run the code. Uh, I see, you it, have a cross-tab query. Never mind. I, I, I yeah. understand how you're doing it now. Okay. Basically, yeah. That way I can have every table I want to audit in this one table, making it much easier for me to, to track it. Okay, so that could be a pretty hefty uh, pivot table if you have a lot of fields. Yes, absolutely. If I had multiple tables that I wanted to, tr to audit, I would probably set up unique queries for each one so that it would display display the columns in the actual order they display in the table as opposed yeah. to in an alphabetical order like they like they do that or I would modify the pivot value in the cross tab query so I build that list of fields to display based on the actual table and the sequence of those fields in that table so that they display that way as opposed to sequentially like this but this cross tab query would basically display the same information that you would have if you had that single table that had all of the fields associated with it. this is not going to be any bigger than that and it gives you the added ability to be able to see very easily what changes were made from what iteration to the next okay when you do an insert of a new record, does that require creating an audit record for every field that was populated? If you do the insert via a form, then it will automatically it'll do the comparison and say, oh, you filled in this field. It was previously null. It will write that record over here to this table. So if we, if we go out here and look for record ID number six over time, you'll see that at the first time I entered that data right here, it inserted three records. As part of this application I wrote for the police department recently, I did not have a method to insert that first record value in this table initially because they were actually doing an upload from an Excel spreadsheet. So what I did was I, I wrote an additional procedure and in that upload process, it identified a file ID. I kept track of what files were updated on what dates. So there was a file ID associated with each upload. So what I did with that was I created a 
select query that says select star from such and such table where field file ID equals 10. And then I iterated through that record set and inserted each one of those fields into the ta this table for each one of those records. You would do the same thing if you were going to run a, like a delete query or an update query. You would need to create the record set that identifies each one of those updates or deletions that you're going to do and, and write a separate record if you were going to try and do something uh, using a bulk process as opposed to using a form. Can I move us on, if you don't mind, to, uh, Ben and Dale? Tim Jacoby has been waiting to ask a question for quite a long time now. Tim? Thank you. Yeah. Temporary. I'm assuming that log temp, you clear it after you've done the update into the log? Correct. Okay. Thank you. So I used the before update event to fill this in. And then in the after update event, I move those records over here and delete them from here. Are you done apart from answering questions? I am. Or... Right. I'm done. Okay. Anyone else want to ask a question? Uh, Ben's put his hand up again. Uh, do you have a provision for combo boxes where you might have an ID value instead of a word. I use whatever the bound column is from the combo box. Okay. So if the bound column is an ID value, I save the ID value. If it's a text value, then I will save the text value. I use this audit method, a little different than this one, but I added to extract the displayed value from the combo as well as the ID value. Yeah. Okay. Um, that makes it's sense. useful. You know, if you want to rebuild the data, the ID is necessary. But if you want the user to see the changes, the IDs don't mean anything. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a good point. That would be a that would be a great addition to it. I'll I'm look, happy to share I'll, my code with you if you want. I'll look yeah, forward, Ben. Cool. I'll look forward to you doing a, a presentation on that at some stage. <laughs> So that's what happens when you when you yeah. offer advice. I know Ben will now start coming up with all the reasons why he doesn't want to. But seriously, Ben, I would be very pleased to see you do that. Right. I'm going to bring this section of the presentation to a close. And I'd like to thank Dale for an excellent presentation. When I said this command bar tool is one of my favorite utilities it's rescued me on many many occasions and i recommend to all of you that you actually do look at that before i move on to the next section the page on my website there's a similar page on the official access user groups website and if you didn't pick up the links earlier, even if you're not a member of Experts Exchange, you can still, by clicking on these links, read all of Dale's articles. And I found out far more about command bars from there than anywhere else put together, I think. Also, you will find here the link to the Simple Audit Log. You can download both the Simple Audit Log and also his Access Shortcut Tool and or context menu tool if you prefer the name there and you can also download a pdf of the presentation is used here in today's presentation so thanks again dale it was a pleasure to have you here and thanks for giving up your time and yep if, so olaf has said thank you dale maybe you can incorporate tim's code that is general gen i will definitely look into that yeah Okay. Next month, we have another American, despite his name, which is a mixture of French and German. Adolf Dupre is going to be giving a presentation again about class modules. And you can find his website here. And Adolf, if you would like to just talk to next month, I would be very grateful. Okay. I delved into using uh, classes within Access. Uh, they're used much more extensively in Visual Basic, but I decided to try and look at them. One of the reasons that I do use them is to prevent temp table bloat that you can get uh, when you create so many temp tables. Another thing is that uh, you can use it to facilitate disconnected record sets. Currently, I'm using it to read Excel sheets that I then merge into databases. The reason that I use the class is so I don't use up all my IDs in the writing to the table and then deleting them if I need to reread the Excel sheet. I can also see where it can be used for that uh, temp audit table. 
instead of actually creating a record in a temp table and then deleting it after you put it in in the main table, you could instantiate a class and hold the information in memory until you decide to write it to the official table, quote unquote. And I, through the internet looking, I was able to create a module that will literally build the class, all the lets, the gets, the terminations, the ads, the deletes, all the functions and all the methods from an access table. It literally creates the class module for you. And it really helps when you have to make changes because even the simplest classes take over a hundred lines of code for a very simple table. And that's what I'm going to present next month. Thank you ever so much. So that's Wednesday, the 1st of May, same time, same place. We'll look forward to you next month. And Olaf, you've got a question. I currently, I believe the data source table name has to be adjusted for each form. This can be simplified. Code is coming, says Olaf. So that's presumably, you're relating that, are you, to Dale's audit tool? Uh, yes, sure. I will send I will send a little change of code to Dale and you for forwarding, maybe. Yep, thank you ever so much. Olaf is giving the talk in July. Uh, along with a, a fellow German, Andre Minhorst, who I haven't got a title for Andre's presentation yet, but Olaf, uh, who's the author of the Enhanced Message Box, is going to be doing one half of the talk, and then uh, Andre will be doing the other half, and also Olaf will be, if necessary, acting as translator. I'd like to thank both Dale and Adolf for their contributions, and also to those of you who raise questions or comments. And as I said, I strongly recommend that you do try Dale's advanced shortcut tool. I keep forgetting the name of it, Dale. Access shortcut tool? Yes. And as I say, it's been a lifesaver for me on many occasions there. I didn't mention about the, the nameless ones, although I did mention it briefly. There are at least three command bars that inexplicably have no name, and that does make life rather difficult when you need to use them because they are common and useful command bars. That may be an occasion where creating your own replacement one for those would be a particularly good idea. Thanks ever so much for everyone for turning up. Colin, Chris. Yeah, just very quickly. This is just a thought for the nameless ones. Is it possible that they are passed through from the Windows menu system? One of them is specific to the form title bar. That's the one that shows up. At least in my experience, it shows up as index number either zero or one all the time. Mm. I, I've never seen it show up anywhere else. Mm. Um, so, in theory, you could refer to that one with its index number. I think. The second one, Colin, was number nine. I haven't really looked to see what controls are associated with that one to see if there's, uh, see if I can make some sense out of what that one is. But I'm wondering whether that one always shows up as number nine as well. No, it doesn't. Um, it okay. Definitely doesn't. Yeah. So, so with, without a title, it's hard. I mean, without a name, it's hard to determine what it's actually trying to accomplish. One last comment. If you develop apps that are to be used by people who've got non-English versions of Office, do beware, although the command bar names where they exist, which they nearly always do, they are consistent. The menu items, of course, are not. So if you can use the index numbers, that's safer. But of course, the index numbers are not guaranteed to be consistent either. So there are complexities, unfortunately. Anyway, thanks ever so much, everybody. And I'll see you next month.